Tuesday, January 5th, Anthony, another great day. Today, we're going back to school, I think. <laughs> I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Lives. That's my friend, Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Hey, everybody. Welcome to No Vacancy Podcast with the one and only... Anthony Melchiori over there and me, Glenn Hausman. Anthony, so great to see you today, my friend. What's up, Mr. Hausman? Hey, uh, not too much. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, pineapple soap in just a second because it's such a good cause. But first, let me say uh, thanks to Best Buy Hospitality for being a uh, sponsor of our show right now. You can check them out at bestbuy.com slash hospitality. Why do you want to do that? Because they've got the amazing Geek Squad, over 4,000 folks ready to help you with all the technology in your hotels. Offload all of that stuff and let the Geek Squad help it. But Anthony, i got to tell you, Bigham Bathhouse is doing this great promotion for these handmade soaps. I'm so impressed with what uh, Kayla is doing. She set up an Etsy store and she is going to be giving $3 or more per bar of soap that is sold so please go check that out at BighamBathhouse.com. All the donations are going to uh, the Hospitality Strong Initiative, Anthony, that you created. Well, part of um, – yeah, part of – she's donating part of the sales to Hospitality Strong. So thank you very much. And um, I tell you, it smells really good. I know. I can't wait. And, uh, you know, I, I do want to use this soap myself, but then I won't have it to, uh, to show off to everybody. But I'll, uh, I'll get myself all cleaned up pretty pretty soon. So, uh, Anthony, anything new going on in uh, your universe over there today? Um, you know, it's interesting. Our our next guest uh, is really near and dear to my heart for a number of reasons. She's a friend of mine. I work with her. Um, we're actually working together in 2021. And um, I'm really interested in what's happening in the college world because I have two children still in college. One just graduated. Right. So uh, we're going to talk about all uh, things that are happening in the college world. And you can imagine, every, you know, every part of the world is upside down. But um, the hotel business, the restaurant business, and I would say the college business are all getting hit really, really hard. Yeah, and so you got to adapt and you got to uh, do new things. So I'm really looking forward to talking to her. Uh, that's why uh, I'm so glad to have Rachel Phillips back from Pharaoh's uh, Resources. Let's bring her on right now. Rachel, welcome back to the show. We had you no. on here last fall. And it was uh, so great to talk to you about, you know, college and stuff like that. And uh, just so everybody knows, today I am not coming at you from over here at the uh, University of Maryland College Park. That's my old uh, alma mater. It's very proud to, uh, to go there. And I wish that they had the resources that you offer back then. Because I got to be honest with you, Rachel, I was not really a great student. And being a young adult at the time, I mean, if you could call 17, 18 year old an adult, I was kind of left on my own to sink or swim. And what you've been doing is you're helping make sure that all of the students in colleges can swim safely through their college so Rachel, education. Before right? you answer that question, uh, one to a hundred, get us a number. I have it written. <laughs> Me and Rachel do this. Go ahead. Okay. 46. Oh, Rachel, you're killing me. Killing you can't see. 70, uh, 77. 70. Ah! Listen, I, we're, I know that we're like soulmates, but we do terrible at this game. Well, we were good, good for two times and then we screwed up. <laughs> you know, what you're, you're, you're right. We're giving you 100 bucks, too. So, so, what's going on in your neck of the woods? Well, listen, um, in the best of times, it is hard to support students through to success just in a normal uh, world. But this last year almost, it has been really amazing to see all of the challenges and the struggles that students have, that universities have as they're trying to support students. So we have just been working so hard since March to try and invest in our schools. We want them to be successful. Um, we've supported over 150,000 students since March through not only student success and academic success, but also all of the challenges that COVID bring. Um, things like quarantine and isolation, students who don't have enough food at home or don't have internet. Um, we've created over 45 different features and workflows in our technology to help schools keep track of students who are distant learning, they're at home, they're doing hybrid. Um, so many of them are in um, res halls by themselves and they're sometimes in classes and sometimes taking you know, online classes from their res halls. So it has just been um, such a learning curve 
um, above and beyond the work we're normally doing where we're trying to support students through whatever their normal life challenges are. Right. And the advantage that we have is that we are getting to think ahead. So where our schools are just kind of in the middle, head down, trying to do what they need to do to, to stay alive and to help students, we've really been able to have this longer vision of, hey, this is what's coming. This is what's going to be next. This is how you need to be thinking about that. So although it's been a really challenging year, our schools have seen a lot of success and we feel really happy about all of the students and the ways that they've been able to to continue on um, over this sort of chaos that's been happening. Go ahead. Uh, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, there is a lot of chaos. And uh, the one thing that struck me as really interesting, what you said is helping kids with internet, because we don't really think that internet is an option in people's lives. We kind of see it as a utility, like water or electricity, but there are a lot of kids out there that don't have the same access that the three of us are sitting here right now with blazing fast uh, internet. And that's got to affect their ability to connect and learn and participate. Absolutely. And Glenn, it's really interesting. So we have students who are rural students who have to drive into town to connect to Starbucks internet or gas station internet. We are getting, we did a survey in March of students, 20,000 students told us what their experience was when they got sent home. Some of them are composing their papers on a phone because they don't have computers. Wow. Um, so they're sitting in their car at the gas station, writing their paper on their phone. Oh, Some God. of them have computers that don't have um, cameras or their sound doesn't work. So they're supposed to be doing online classes, but they can't hear or see what's going on. So the level of hardship is really um, a lot, a lot of things we have not thought about before. Right. Yeah. I think about my kids in high school. I'm very fortunate. We're in a district where all of the kids got a Chromebook, for example. So they wow. were provided with uh, the tools to go home with during this particular time of crisis. Not something that they did prior to this, but that's interesting. But at university, um, you know, Anthony has got a, a kids in school. Um, my buddy has a, a daughter that's in upstate New York. She was in college this fall and it was a really isolating experience for her. It was basically her alone in a dorm room Yes. taking all of her classes uh, online that, you know, for a lot of kids that could cause a lot of loneliness and depression in particular that first year away. I remember my first year away was very, very difficult on, on me psychologically. I can't imagine layering on all of these other issues. Yeah. In fact, um, there was a study done recently, 85% of students reported that the, that COVID had a negative effect on their grades. And that was equally split with academic issues. So taking online classes where they don't have access to faculty and they can't ask questions, but then also this mental health piece where they feel really isolated, even if they're on campus, they're not experiencing the full community enrichment um, that they're used to. So I, I think we said last time we were together, how these students are um, surviving is so admirable. As adults, we're having a difficult time. And to have these students who are going and feeling isolated and overwhelmed and unmotivated and all of those things, it's, it's just amazing the kinds of things that they're living through right now. Yeah, one of the things that you do, um, Rachel, that's pretty good is um, your systems over there at Faust Resources, you have predictive analysis. So before a student even starts, you could start to tell whether or not there might be issues with that person as an individual. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we are looking at things like um, demographic data. So we assume, for example, if a student's a first generation student, that they're going to need extra intervention. We're looking at things like high school GPA. So how did they do academically in high school? Things like how far are they from home, um, whether or not they have picked their major, all sorts of things that are going to give us an indication that they will have a special need that we need to make sure that we're addressing and engaging. Um, and then after we've identified that group, you know, we've talked before of the success funnel, we've got to find them and then we've got to connect with them, make sure that they have a person who's on their side. And then we can go through and start solving those problems. How are we going to help you get acclimated to college? How are we going to help you pick your major? Those sorts of things that can be addressed, but we just have to be able to find them before we can do that. Right. Um, so how are you focused on today when you have these kids that are there that might be struggling? How are you able to intervene to make sure that they stay safe? I mean, we just read uh, the story of a, a congressional representative whose son committed suicide because of depression got to be too overwhelming. It's something that we don't talk about enough, but it's something that a lot of us are feeling either clinically or not these days. 
Absolutely. So I think people just need to feel like they're seen. And there's not a lot that we can solve in terms of we do have to wear masks and we do have to be isolated and we are taking online classes. But just having a space to say this is really hard and I'm really struggling today. I'm really feeling overwhelmed, I think is so important. Um, one of the things that we're telling our schools is to make sure that every student has a touch point relationship on campus. So this is somebody that they've been connected to before, who they know, who they are, um, who they trust, who's invested in them, who can say, I'm going to give you a call and just see how are you doing? Because remember, so many of our schools have delayed the start of our spring. So, so many of them, I know, Anthony, I think your kids right. aren't going to the middle of February. So many of them are super delayed. So you have students who are spending time at home, not doing classes, just stuck with their families. Um, and so a lot of our schools are doing call campaigns, just a call to say, hey, what's going on? Where are you struggling? What's been really difficult for you? And then how do we stand in the gap and kind of bridge those difficulties that you're having? Um, and then also a lot of outsourced mental health. We have a lot of schools that are doing outsourcing of uh, counseling and mental health because so many more students are needing it these days. You know, you're you're an expert in mental health. You're an expert in in counseling. How have you been through this? Is this is this challenged you? Has this brought you to a point in your professional career? It's like this, this is a little this a this a little something something. Yeah, I would say that um, from March until June, it was okay because it was new and you're like getting used to it and you're trying to figure it out, right? And then in June, I was like, I'm done with this. <laughs> I'm ready for this to be over. I'm it's the novelty has worn off. This is not interesting anymore. Um, but you know, Anthony, something that we so every year Ferris picks a theme. Last year we picked community, which was prophetic because it's a lot of what we've had to do this year about how do we keep in touch with people in community. Well, our theme of 2021 is Kintsugi, which I don't know if you know what this is, but it's the Japanese um, practice of fixing something broken with gold. What is it called? It's called Kintsugi, K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I, Kintsugi. Um, so actually here's my book that I've been reading about it. Cool. Kintsugi. And the idea here is that you have a piece of pottery that's been broken and it's really difficult and sad and hard because you loved this thing. Um, but this Japanese art is that you come back and you patch it together using gold and you make it into something more beautiful. So we call that like the golden repair or the poetic mend. Rachel, hold that book up once again so everyone can take a good look yeah, at it. And then we'll get to you. To look up to Amazon. Move a little bit. Right. Right. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Kintsugi, finding strength in imperfection. I love that whole notion of finding strength in imperfection because we are all imperfect beings, right, you know Rachel? What? I'm gonna I'm gonna ask our producer to put the link up for Amazon because mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna buy it as soon as this is over. It is, it has been so renewing to me to say everything's broken. We got to figure out a new way to, to mend it, to put it together in a more beautiful way, a way that's more powerful, um, a way that keeps the best of what was. When was but, that book written? Sorry, what? When was that book written? Good question. No. Look it up. Look, 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 see what, see I feel like it could, right, you feel like it could be something from feudal times, right? I, no, I think it was, it was written right after the war. It's, no, this one was written in 2019. But, it, it, but it, this is an ancient, I mean, right, this is right. this is a very ancient sacred process. Um, and in Japan, they're like, they have a period of when the thing breaks before they can sugi it, they have a period of mourning where they say this thing is broken oh. and it's really hard and we're really sad. Yeah, I, think, I think that's fascinating because if I never defined myself of thinking that way, but if I had to define myself, I would say that that's kind of the way I think. Like I try to find sanity within chaos and right. the more chaos, especially in business, it seems the more sane I become. Yeah. Because and I, I kind of deal with what is happening and mourn that and say, okay, now let's, we broke that. Let's fix it going forward. That's interesting. I, I can't wait to read it. Yeah. So Anthony, you're so good at the optimistic piece, right? Like it's broken and we're going to be sad about yeah. it for a minute, but now we've got to figure out like, what are we going to do and how are we going to make it better? And how are we going to make it more amazing? And so 
Um, as I'm thinking about this, first of all, I feel really renewed. It's helped my mental space to be like, okay, yes, everything's broken and we've had this period, but now we're going to start being strategic and we're going to put it right. back to and it's going to be better. And I would say this is something that higher education and the hospitality business has in common that everything the way we used to do is broken and now we have to figure out what to do, right? Right. So I got a picture here. Check that out. So that is really, really interesting because it actually makes it look more beautiful, as yeah. you were saying. I love that. Yeah. You know, and, and I think really what schools didn't think about and what I didn't think about was my daughter went to school. She was learning in the dorm room. She was on her soccer team. I mean, her I say it all the time, soccer, but her volleyball team. Um, but she was still isolated. And she has, you know, a, 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 a boyfriend up there that she's been dating for a while. And so she had a lot going on. She had her volleyball team. She had a boyfriend who she's close to with the family that lives right near school. And she still felt these 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 these, these moments of just complete, you know, you know, quiet and sadness. So some of her friends, some on teams, some not on teams. What I'm hearing through her is they felt the same way. It's like isolation. And I don't think the schools have done a great job. Even my daughter, who graduated, she graduated in the basement. You know, early six months. And I don't think that they did a great job with with making sure she was okay. Thank God, like we're very close and we're all together. But I think that the, the, most of the schools that I've seen have have failed at it. Well, I will tell you that I think it's a thing that they better figure out quick. They've been really preoccupied with the academic piece, which that's a whole other wreck, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that they need to work on in terms of academics, but ignoring the fact that students go to college to be connected and to be in community is a huge mistake. Um, and I've been reading a lot of articles about how higher education is going to change. And one of the things they've said is, um, although there are lots of things we can do different, we need to get more flexible, we need to be cheaper, we need to offer more support. There's a lot of things that, that this pandemic has kind of brought out that we need to do different. One thing that we had right before was community. People living in the same place, sharing the same space, you know, sharing rooms, being in the library, eating together. That is a part of higher education that cannot be replaced by anything other than getting the vaccine and being able to go back to seeing each other without our mask on and being able to spend time together. There's just no replacement for humans of that piece of community, you know, that's that we've all been really suffering. Um, by not Interesting. So why should universities care about that sort of thing? I just think back to my college experience, they treated me like an adult. So therefore, they didn't really think of me other than me making sure I paid the bursar. Right. Yeah. So why do you feel and I agree with you, but why do you feel that it's uh, it's critical to have a more holistic 360 degree approach to the students uh, participation in the university life? Well, higher education has changed so much since we went. Um, tuition is way higher. They have a lot more administrators. So you have to pay more money so that a student or a school can be solvent. Mm -hmm. They're very tuition driven. So financially, it's very important that they recruit students and that recruiting uh, students stay and graduate. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to be making a value proposition because remember community colleges uh, can can do academics if it's just about a degree. If we're not right. working on community, they can do it for way cheaper than some of these four-year private institutions. Um, the I think the comparison is like um, a hundred uh, sorry one one thousand two hundred dollars per credit hour for a private four-year institution. Mm -hmm. versus three hundred dollars per credit hour for a community college. So you better make a case that there is some value to students coming and spending time in your res halls in community. We're doing student development there, right? It's not just that we're saying here are lectures and you're going to learn and then go on with a degree. We actually are talking about taking 18 year olds and developing them into thinking adults over the next four years. And that crucible of um, colleges and universities where students can come and live, I think is so important. And schools have not done a great job of articulating or maybe even recognizing how important that community and the holistic care um, for students really is. Right. Um, so you're, you guys are doing a great part. That retention, that word retention is what came to uh, my mind over there. Because I remember, and again, I'm sorry to keep going back to the late 80s, early 90s, because that was my <laughs> experience in it. 
But I remember sitting in that big classroom um, with hundreds of people, and they're like, take a look to your left, take a look to your right. One or two of those people will, will not be here next year or whatever it was. It's very counterintuitive to the fact that these universities want to make money. So right. <laughs> you, you're able to get in there with your resources and help the universities determine who are, who, which kids may not make it the long haul and be able to reverse course to help make the student's life better while adding profitability to the universities, correct? Yeah, that's right. So what's really interesting about this idea of retention is that it came out of accessibility, that basically um, this man in the 70s, Vincent Tinto, said, if you are going to admit students, if you're going to admit first generation students, students who maybe don't have the greatest GPAs, if you are going to admit students, you better be committed to helping them succeed. Because what happens to students who are admitted and pay for two semesters, but then don't graduate is they not only don't have a college degree, but they also have all of this debt. So retention really came from you have a responsibility if you are letting students into your school to make sure that they can be successful and you have to be able to provide the support for them to do that. So for financial health, retention is really important because we want those students all four years. But even beyond that, for student success, if you get admitted to a college, you should have a reasonable expectation that you will be able to pay for it and be successful so that you can graduate with that degree. And so that's why schools are really investing in that piece. Um, and I think, I mean, the model going forward after COVID is going to be really, really interesting to see how it gets worked out. I think over the last year, schools lost some, somewhere between 120 and $150 billion. Um, wow. We have... Uh, a 30% decrease in students who are over 24 going to school. Transfers are down 8%. Students who have stopped out are up 16%. I mean, every metric that you can think of, schools are going to have to figure out a new way to engage students to be able to be successful because it is um, pretty financially crippling. And, and you think that you think that we're at a, a time in the next few years where college just isn't as important as it used to be? Yeah. So one thing that I think is going to happen is we have kind of been sold this bill that the way you're successful in life is you go to college. And there are a lot of people who would rather do some blue collar job where they can make a really good salary. And so I think this hardship of COVID is going to make students think, well, maybe I don't need to go to college. Maybe right. I can go get trained up on something else and then get a job doing that instead. So I absolutely think that you're going to see a drop just in general um, students coming coming back to college. Yeah. And I think as long as you can show that you were productive during those couple of years, even taking part time jobs, I think as a person hiring people, if you say, listen, COVID hit us hard financially, we couldn't do it, you know, and, and I took some part time jobs. And, but this is what I want to do. And I'm going to try to do it without college. Whereas before I wouldn't look at them as, as way I would look at them now. I'm going to give them I'm going to give them a break. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the whole the way that it casts your experience over the last year and the, the next two years, I think is going to be really interesting. You have 28 percent of college students who attended in the fall still don't know if they're going to come back in the spring. Oh they haven't God. made up their mind about that. They're like, well, we'll see how the vaccine goes and what's happening with our college and testing. So you just have a lot of people. Um, I talk about it in terms of like, I'm not breaking up with my school, but I'm taking a break from my school, right? right. I'm going to take a year and I'm going to do this stop out and just see what happens and what jobs can I get and what does my future look like and what can I do in this year when what um, the best parts of college and university are not being delivered to me. I'm not getting community. I'm not getting classroom experience. I have a year to just make up what I want to do. Um, and Anthony, to your point, if you saw that on a resume in three years, you'd be like, that's amazing that you took that time and decided to do something really um, interesting. I'm, prob I'm probably going to hire you before I hire the college grad because, because you, you know, right now it, it's, and we, we talk about it a lot. It's, it's the entrepreneur spirit. And, um, you know, it's those kids that figure it out, take a breath and say, hey, let me try this and let me stick to it. And really stick to itiveness is really the way to go. And that doesn't mean stick to it, one thing that you've tried, but stick to trying. You know, it's just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, and I was having this conversation with my daughter yesterday. I was driving her somewhere and I said that. You're like, she was like, what's the point? Like that was the point of life. But like, what's the point of going to college 
and then getting a job. Like, like I said, you're right. The point of what I've been saying since you're a little girl is the point of life is to have fun and to be respectful and to have gratitude. Right. Having a job pays the bills and gives you, and hopefully gives you passion and makes you happy. But that's not the point of, of the job. Isn't the point, the happiness and the gratitude is the point. Yes. You have to pay your bills. Yes. You have to pay your mortgage. Yes. You have to get a car and all that stuff. But if you're not, if you don't have gratitude, like even during this COVID, you know, we all had ups and downs during COVID, but like, I see people there. I'm just grateful. I have, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who has a big business or had a big business in Italy. And, Two years ago, he was complaining about it. Now, like, you know, I'm bored, I'm this, I'm that. And like I said, hey, how are you doing now? He goes, I, I'd give anything to just get my business back. Right. So I was like, you know, I think people like us, we, we kind of live in the gratitude. So when this kind of hits us, yeah, this sucks, but okay. It, it, you know, it, it sucks, man. I lost a friend. It's horrible. I, I'm seeing a lot of friends struggle. You know, we've had some challenges, but at the end of the day, that's where you've got to live. So as a young college kid, the one thing, hopefully, if there's anything that they're, te- they're they're learning is they are in a place of gratitude that they're thankful for their family. They're thankful for that room that they're in that may have spotty Wi-Fi. At least you're in the room. You're not on the side of the road trying to get you know internet from a gas station. Absolutely. So I think really, the word going through this, and I know it's hard for people to understand that, is gratitude. Well, Anthony, that became really clear to me when we got this new year because I thought to myself when on New Year's, I thought, well, at least this year can't be worse than last year. Oh, yes, again. That is not true. There are so many. Oh, Rachel, it could always be worse. (laughs) No, but you know, when people when people said that, I was like, well, it depends on what part of COVID were you in. Right. You know, like there's a few a small percentage of that were in the real, real bad, like deciding whether you live or die, right. deciding whether you go in a freezer truck or the cemetery. I mean, it was bad for a lot of families. And I witnessed it from my, my neighbor, who's a good friend of mine. So it was bad. And it could have gotten worse because other people in the family could have got. So it's always, you know, so so I don't really, when people say that, it's like 2021. It can't be worse than 2020. I was like, dude, have you, Not are, true. Have you been paying attention? God has a way of saying Sit over there. Hold my beer. I'll be right back. (laughs) (laughs) So let me just uh, throw this out. I don't know if you guys had the chance to watch uh, Soul on Disney Plus over the the holiday break. But uh, Anthony, it really, the whole thematic of the film gets to exactly the point that you're talking about, that we need to focus more on the moments of life, the things that move up, that that happen on a day-to-day basis, instead of creating the finish line that we're never, ever going to get to, because a lot of that is just... uh, false promises that you'll feel better when you get to that point. You, you know, it's interesting. You know, I work with several companies, a lot of companies. And one of the things this year is when I was going through the contracts, you know, and I work with, with Rachel, but now they really become friends. They can't get rid of me. I told them they can't get rid of me. <laughs> and as I'm going through things, I'm like, no, no. Yep. 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 No, 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 no. I was like, I've decided that I'm not dealing with people I don't want to deal with period in the story. And I'm just not going to do it. doesn't mean I'm pissed off or whatever. I just, I'm not going to do it. And dealing with Rachel and Matt and Pharaohs. I mean, they're just such professionals. I'm grateful. I'm truly grateful for them. And 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 that's kind of, I've just learned, I guess, at an early age to, to just be grateful for what's in front of you. Be grateful for that glass of water or that those eggs or whatever it is. You know, and, and I think that if, if anything, I think this generation, and maybe I'll eat my words in 10 years, I think this is going to be a grateful generation. I just feel it. I just, there's no way they can go through what they're going through. Right. Miss senior, senior prom, miss, miss graduating, miss going across that stage, you know, miss their friends, spend a year in their room learning, teaching themselves and not come out of this. And when they are with their friends and when they do, when they're able to graduate and they're able to do the things that they missed, I can't imagine them not being great. I see it with my own kids. I see yeah. that they're a lot more huggy and more grateful. And they're, they're saying things to me. And I'm like, who entered your body? <laughs> it's like, you're being nice to me. What happened? <laughs> well, it is really interesting that it um, equalizes the playing field for everybody. So we don't talk about fair. No, it's not fair. And there's nothing to be done about it. So I then what you have to do. It sucks big. Yeah. And then what you have to do, Glenn, to your point is you have to get very present. You have to be very like present that. with people like and say like, in this moment, we're laughing and having a good time. And that's precious. 
right? Right. It, it, let's, uh, let's get existential for a second. It's a little hard sometimes for people to live for the moment and in the moment because we've all been inculcated into this belief that when you're growing up, it's always to, you're, you've got to go to school because you're going to have to do this, this, and the other thing. Yeah. And it's always a series of thing of hurdles that are put up to you, things that are always going to occur in the future. And there's never enough emphasis in society put on the right now. And that's something that um, I've realized as I've gotten older and I'm hoping my kids can appreciate because I, I would like them to live more in the moment, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. Yeah, and, and, and I, you know, I just don't think that, you know, if you look, somebody just wrote, I think Colleen wrote, um, our fan wrote about electricians and plumbers, right? A lot of them, they didn't, maybe they went in the military, maybe they didn't. Maybe they went to college, maybe they didn't. But they were like, you know what? Maybe my father, my uncle, my brother was in a union and whatever, and now I'm going to become an electrician or plumber or whatever. They make really good money. They got a lot of freedom. You know, if they they have their own business, they get to they get to do kind of work when they want to work, or when the work's there, and then they take off. I don't know. It's like just do what that makes you have. Like I, one of my daughters is like, you need to be a teacher because one, you want to be a teacher, but she goes, I, maybe I want to do this. Maybe. I said, babe, you love weekends off, you love being around the family, you love your summers, you love going to the beach, you don't want to work till eight nine o'clock at night. Become a teacher, work really hard, but then you're off at three o'clock. And then you got your summers off and you got your weekends off. And, you know, if you go my line of work, you know, I just was talking to a friend of mine. Um, actually, we had him on last week, uh, Chef uh, T uh, right before the holiday, uh, Chef Bruno Tisson. And he, up until his new gig, for what did he say, 43 years, he never saw a holiday. Right. So you got to do what lines wow. up with your personality. And like hopefully another thing that, that will kind of be demystified is living up to other people's expectations. Right. I'll give you the, I'll give you a perfect example. I'll share this with you. Um, we're working on this show and I'm having a two o'clock meeting or three o'clock meeting today with my producers. And I want to do something completely different like I always do. And they're like, no, this is the way we're going to do it. And we're getting traction and all this stuff. And then last week, and, and I remember being on the phone when they were talking about this, they were going to post something on my social media saying, hey, do you want to see Anthony get back on TV? Well, I don't know if I want to see Anthony get back on TV. So <laughs> asking my fans that was like I saw it and I was like oh my god and I deleted it like a day later because I didn't see it for a day and I felt so like like that's not what I want or like I might want it but they asked my fans that and I remember being on the call they were going to do that I was like yeah that's fine whatever and I didn't think about it. when I saw it in black and white I was like really like I'm not that guy I don't want like are you kidding me and it was just something that I just remember like like just running away from going, oh, that feels so dirty and gross. And like, do you want to see me back on TV? Like it was so the complete opposite of who I am. And it was just like, he's like, listen, I'm grateful, man, for everything that I'm doing, everything I have. And I, if something happens, it happens. But to chase something and to want something so badly, I think that's the problem with today's society. Everybody's chasing shit just so they can tell their friends or just so they have a status or just so they have something as opposed to, and when I was 18, 19, 20, I guess I did too. But, right. but, but I, 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 hopefully this generation will be a generation of gratitude and less, and, and less worried about status and more worried about happiness. Well, so Anthony, the thing is you're able to do that because you have such a strong sense of self. So when you see a thing that comes from you that is not congruent with you, you're like, no, that is not me. But I mean, it is true for 18, 19, 20 year olds. So much of the pressure is coming from parents to say, I want you to have a college degree. This is what your life is going to look like. And so part of that conversation with students has to be, what is your vision and what do you want? And what are the values that are important? Just like you said with your daughter, like, hey, you don't want to be working all the time. You love having work-life balance. You like spending time with kids. This is the vision that you are going to create for your life because back to Kintsugi, right? Everything's broken. Mm -hmm. Like this lockstep, graduate from high school, graduate from college, get your next job, blah, 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 blah. No, it's broken now. So we actually have space to say, how do we want to reconstruct your future in a in a vision that is true to you, that will make more sense to you, and that reflects what you value and what you want instead of we just march through and the next thing you know you're 50 and you're you're done. You know, how many people have you, yeah, hey, how many people have you seen in your <laughs> life? How many people have you seen in your life where you're like so happy and then you get to know them and like they're making 
decent money. They live in a decent house and they, they drive a 10 year old car and they're so happy. And you're like, like, like you don't look like, you know, you have like everything you need in life, but you're the happiest person in the world. And then you see the people with the three cars in the mansion and they're divorced 75 times and they're miserable. And it's like happiness is the answer and right. being true to your personal brand will never, ever, ever, ever drive you in the wrong way. Now, when you're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, you're developing your personal brand. Right. So the things that feel good, keep those. The things that feel bad, get rid of. But when you get rid of them, you got to get rid of them like that. You can't wait and hold on to them because that's what kills you. Yeah. That's what with, with kids and, and even adults that we're holding on to those bad feelings. It just go after those good feelings. Yeah. Right. That's I, exactly. I highly recommend everybody check out this uh, documentary on uh, minimalism that came out on Netflix on New Year's Day. It's really fascinating. It talks about freeing yourself from this addiction to things that the marketers have forced us to and how easy it is to just keep clicking and buying stuff and having it be delivered here tomorrow. And that's not really filling the emptiness in our lives. No, it they, is. Amazon right? fills me up. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but having things, it makes you feel good, but then you go back to your natural reset. And the whole idea is to shed all of those things and focus on the issues that Anthony was talking about more so. That 10-year-old car, old car is fine because those people are more connected to other people. They're more connected to life. They're more connected to really what's truly important that we've all lost our ways with because – we all think now in our modern society, it's all about consumerism and things, things, right. things. And, and minimalism isn't, you know, you know, drinking, you know, green leaves, right. in, <laughs> in, 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 you know, in shorts, and 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 not having any possessions. To me, min minimalism is: I drive a nice car, I have a pool, I have a decent, a nice house. And I don't really need much else. That's that right. means minimalism. I'm not having a cabin. I don't live in a cabin in the woods and don't have running water. You know, it's like I don't need much. Well, the you thing know? is, I think for minimalists, it's like what you own is valuable. Right. There you go. You own there everything. You go. But the things that are valuable are the things that I'm invested in. And I don't need 100 things. I just need four things that I love. Right. That make my life better. Right. That's right. right. Right, like like friends, like a, a friend of mine who has a lot of cars. It's like he doesn't have anything else. He doesn't even have a nice house, but he got a lot of cars. That fills him up, and that's good. He likes that, but he doesn't need a yacht. He doesn't need. It's like somebody said to me, "Would you ever want a boat?" I said, "As long as I can afford to pay somebody to take care of it and drive me around, I want a boat." And they're like, well, why don't you just go get a regular boat? I said, because I don't want to clean it and I don't want to drive myself around. The purpose of being on a boat is to enjoy the sea, not to worry about the boat. Right. That's right. So until I can afford a yacht, I ain't buying a boat. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard about this um this idea that the more choices you have, the less the like of choice. Be satisfied? Yeah. So when I talk to students about this, we talk about it in terms of picking what you're gonna do with your life. And if you think of like you have 500 TV channels, you can never settle on one because you you're like, this is pretty good, but I got 500 channels. What's the next one? What's the next one? What's the next one? You can yeah. never make the best choice, right? But if if you only have three, then you look at the three things and you say, this one will make me happy. I don't have to keep searching for another thing. And I think things are like that too, right? It was a lot easier when you had ABC, CBS, and NBC. I ask my kids all the time, when was the last time you watched something on NBC? And you know what they say? What's NBC? NBC? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, The Paradox of Choice is a great book. I highly recommend it. When I was um, an adjunct professor at NYU, I would teach out of that book because it's really why about why more is actually less. And it's all about arguing that eliminating consumer choices greatly reduces anxiety for shoppers and just in your life in general, which yeah. makes a whole lot of sense. Oh, That's look, at there it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if, and if you think about it, you know, we all go to our favorite pair of pants. We all go to our favorite TV show. <laughs> we all go when we, we order sushi, we or, order the same damn thing every single time. When we go to, to, to the restaurant, as my friend Joe Isadori would say, the Italian restaurant, you order chicken parmesan. So so we all are creatures of habits. I always say, you know, my, when, when, when my kids were growing up, it was like, we need a bigger house. I was like, you go you go to the bathroom in one bathroom and you you watch one TV and you sleep in one bed. We're good. You got everything you need. You got everything you need. We're covered. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Uh, yeah. Mike says, uh, you know, when you surround yourself with too many choices, you always feel like you're missing out. And the other thing where you feel like you're missing out is this whole notion of the keeping up with the Joneses, trying to have what others have so you could feel, um, 
you know, better about your yourself. You know, and if if, if you really want to watch, like if you really are a Facebook person or a social media person and you watch your friends from high school, watch how their lives change over five or 10 years, right? And the things that they were saying, oh my God, oh my God, this is great. I'm so happy. And all of a sudden you're like, now you're, you've changed your life. You're living with, you know, someone else or like, it's like, it's, it, it's like, just find happiness. I have a friend that just seems so much happier than she was 10 years ago. And I'm just watching this on Facebook of what's developed in her life. And that, you know, and, and, and I, and that's the key. Like, even when I have a moment, I'm just like, what makes me happy? I'm going to go do that. I'm going to go do what makes me happy. And that's it. And, and it's, it's that simple. I mean, I don't mean to keep saying the same thing over and over again, but if, if COVID has taught us anything, and if this year of political craziness has taught us anything, it's keep the people around you really close, man. And having yeah. a beer and a conversation is a lot better than a brand new Bentley. But not too close, maybe six feet apart. But <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, back to what uh, Anthony was saying. Uh, Anthony Chillis was saying. Steve Jobs is always wearing the same clothing. That's uh, absolutely right because it frees you up from having to make those decisions, so you could focus on what's most important to you. You, you know, uh, Elon Musk. You sold everything. He moved to Texas. I think he's living next to Joe Rogan, and he's like, <laughs> I sold everything. We could like I couldn't imagine like even getting a country house. Like we've thought about getting a country house for years. And I've stopped. We were about to buy a condo even last year. And I stopped. And it was like, it was like, why? And I was just like, I don't want to worry about another thing. I don't want to worry that I have to go to this condo upstate or this condo somewhere, you know, in Florida, because we haven't been there in six weeks or six months. Right. And then have to worry about the rent. Then I have to worry about the electric. Then I have to worry about I don't want to worry about it. I just like I literally don't want to worry about anything. I like, I want less problems and less things as I get older. I guess that's just a matter of getting older. Well, you don't want to be entrapped, right? You don't want to buy yeah. things that then you're a slave to. You want to be free of things you that you know, brain calories. I want you to kind of just talk about that for a second. I think that that is so important. You don't want to be trapped by possessions or even trapped by relationships. So how do you mentor, whether it be relationships, you know, marriage counseling, or whether it be students, like how do you teach them? Because I think that that is powerful, what you just said, being entrapped by things. And I think most people, that's 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 their problem. I think most people are entrapped. Like if you have three kids and you have a wife and you have, and you have a mortgage and you have college funds and everything, you're entrapped by that. Now, if you love that, and if that's what you've draw, drawn up in your blueprint in your life, then make sure you dig, dig, dig deep in that and say, Oh, this is exactly where I want to be. It may not be all roses. It may not be perfect. It may suck really bad some days. Okay. But like even before when I was looking down at my phone, my daughter's up at, this, at the ski slopes and she was concerned about something. I was worried about her. It's like, you don't want to worry about everything, but, but you know, that's part of the package, right? Yeah. So, so I think that feeling entrapped, I mean, talk about that a little bit. So I think the distinction that you have to make in your own life is the difference between being entrapped and the difference between investing. And those are two very different oh, wow. things, right? So one is like, this thing owns me. Uh, like Anthony's talking about a boat, like right. that's entrapment. Now mm -hmm. I've got to make sure that it's seaworthy and I've got to drive it and I've got to do this and I've got to do this. And that's you are not getting pleasure from that. You, that is your master. Like you're in, they're in charge of you. They're the ones who are saying, this is what you have to do. This is what you can't do versus an investment, which is what we do with our children and our friendships and our community and our work. Um, if that's something that gives you pleasure where you say, yes, this is hard. And yes, I have to put in something to this, but the return on that is really valuable. And it's not just that I'm pouring into this thing and I'm never going to be able to be free of it. It's that I'm investing in it because the returns are really going to be precious to me. And it's something that's very, very important. So I think if you can make that distinction, being trapped by something versus something that you're investing in. And the question is, what are the returns? 
if the returns are, I can check that off my list and I don't have to think about it for another two days until then it calls me back and I've got to do something else for it. That's entrapment. If it's, um, what are you doing here? I'm putting energy and time into this, but the return is going to be really amazing and, and really valuable to me. Then that's something that I think you invest in even more. Wow. I think that was so powerful and so simple, but so like people don't look at it that way. Say it again. If you're, if, if, if you're entrapped by something, say that again. Okay, so if you're entrapped by something, it means it's your boss. It's telling you, now you have to think about this, now you have to clean it, now you have to do this, now you do this, and the returns on that are nothing. They're just, okay, I got that off the list for today. Tomorrow, I'm gonna have to think about it again. An investment is where you're saying, yes, I'm putting time and I'm putting energy and I'm putting thought process, but the return of that is gonna be, I have these amazing children, or I have a great position that I really love, or I'm a, tighter in my community because I've invested in that. So, you know, you know, you know what's interesting is in working with you is you like, you guys have a software, you guys have technology that helps college, but that's not who you are. And that's not what you're about. And maybe this isn't what you want me to say, but this is what I'm going to say. It's your personal insights, your, your professional way of talking to people, enlightening people, bringing the executive team and the students and, and really understanding how that all works, that dynamic and that, that power, that power struggle is what you bring. And every time I talk to you and every time I'm invested in one of your meetings, I learn something. And so when you're working with a company, whether you're selling technology, whether you're selling paint, make sure that people in the company bring a hell of a lot more uh, value than paint or, or technology. And, and you guys really bring so much more, um, uh, uh, so much more value than that. Thank you. Thank so you. So Rachel, bring it, bring all of this stuff back to how you're, uh, you're helping on campuses and all of that. Okay. So a couple of things that I want, um, for your listeners just to be aware of, especially if you have college students or if you're employing college students, the thing that we're about to face with the spring semester is academic probation, which I'm telling you, this is going to be really, really difficult for students. Students, um, have moved to online classes or they were in quarantine or whatever the way that they experienced those classes were. I'm expecting to have a huge population of academic probation students, which means that last semester, in the fall, they did not have a high enough GPA to continue in good standing. So they're going to be put on academic probation. Um, and usually for schools, that means that they have to raise their GPA up to a certain level to get off academic probation. Otherwise, they'll be in suspension. So we're talking to all of our schools about revisiting policies and um, how you talk to students about academic probation, what's going to happen in the spring in terms of the requirements for those students. Um, you also just think about how this can be really difficult for students moving forward. So if you had a class that you had to pass in order to continue in your major, for smaller schools, some of them only offer those classes every fall of right. even years. So you might be a whole year behind right. now if you did not pass your prerequisite. So um, we're talking to our schools really seriously about what to do about this pro academic probation problem that's going to be coming for students because I think that population is going to be really huge. And, and what, are, what are the same, what are some of the answers to that? Like, like if the, the first question I would ask a student if they were a good student is why, right? So, so let's, fix, let's fix the why of why that happened. But now, all right, it, it happened. Maybe you got lazy. Maybe you were just depressed. Maybe you had COVID. Maybe your family was upside down. Okay. Or maybe you just took advantage of it and you didn't do the friggin' work. And, right. you, tried, and you, tried, you tried to get, get you know, uh, take the easy way out because you want TikTok all day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're here. Now, what can I do as an institution to move you forward without keeping you back or without screwing up your entire, you know, next year? Okay, so there's a couple of things I'm recommending. The first one is that you actually have two different groups. You have students on academic probation where historically they've struggled. They have lower high school GPAs, maybe before, maybe they're juniors and they've never really done well academically. So that's a more traditional, like, hey, we really need some academic support for these students. We need to understand what's been going on even before COVID where you weren't being, um, you know, successful. And then you have another population where they've been doing really well, all of those things, Anthony, that you listed, they, they have family problems or something was difficult because of COVID. That's a different population. And then what I'm telling schools to do is they have to um, develop short courses. So we need Maymester courses. We need summer courses. We need 
study at your own um, pace courses so that those students can get ramped up to then go on and, and be successful. You also need to address like transfer credits. So maybe I can take this, this class at the community college while I'm also taking these other classes at my um, uh, graduate graduating institution. So I need you to be able to accept more right. transfer credits so that I can get ramped up to then get back on the line. So really, I think the schools that are going to win are the those that have those short courses or accepting other courses that students will be able to then catch up. I did that. I took Spanish at the local community college because I figured it would be uh, less taxing for me. Yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of things like CLEP tests and there's a lot of different ways for you to give students credit for those courses outside of the normal like semester timeline, you know? So, so can I ask you another question that has nothing to do with um, anything outside of, <laughs> uh, I really want to know your input because I'm starting to depend on you as a, uh, you know, as a mentor, you're mentoring me as well. <laughs> And and um, I think you mean woman tour. <laughs> how do you keep? How do you help a student or a faculty member keep the noise out today with all the social media, with all of the politics, with all of the like? I've actually found myself the last three days really enjoying the craziness of the political. Uh, world right now. I'm enjoying how stupid it is and how yeah. stupid people are acting. So I'm actually having fun watching it because it just shows me how off chart people can go because of their own ego. So I'm really enjoying it. And I'm also enjoying people standing up to this, these crazy egos. <laughs> but I usually put it back in a box and say, you know, I'm not on either side, but I just, you know, I'm going to go back and do what I do. So how do you keep, how do you train people just to keep the noise out? This is my question. Yeah. So you guys have seen Social Dilemma. Have you seen that movie? Oh, Anthony, you have to watch it. I don't it. want to. I'm afraid of it. It's scary. And I'm the, afraid reason, of it. the reason I bring it up is because we are talking about an addiction that is um, worse, than, worse than the heroin. Intentional, intentional. These companies intentionally want you to be entrapped by them. Mm -hmm. And so... I would say it is a huge difficulty to fight against all of these technologies that are their only goal is to keep you addicted. To yeah, them. I'm afraid to watch it for that reason. It, 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 will, it will literally I'm afraid I'll lose hope for, for this generation. Yeah, I think it's a real. what I would say is we have to talk about the truth that it is a um, intentional uh, effort to keep you entrapped. It is intentional. They are doing it on purpose. And I would just say, I don't know so much about college students and what universities and colleges can do, but I would say as the parent of a younger child, I mean, I'm militant about, we have to be very, very careful to understand what is real and what is not real. And all that stuff that doesn't affect me today is not something that I want for you to be putting in your you know, brain. You know, Tony, I just had this conversation with one of my kids and I'm like, did you listen to the tapes of, of, of what happened the other day? And they're like, no. And she has a very strong opinion about him, but she hasn't listened to the tapes. I said, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to have an opinion. I said, I'm sorry, you can't have an opinion. It's like, why? I said, because you didn't listen to the tapes. You listen to social media. After you see the tapes, you right. will double down on your opinion. There's no doubt. But you can't have that opinion if you didn't listen to the tapes because all you're doing is going by other people. That's exactly right. And I love that because, you know, part of what we've always tried to do is make sure that people are picking good sources. Right. You know, it's like you can't just say this thing. You need to have some it needs to be an informed opinion. Look, look at what's happening today. Whether you support what's happening with the president or not, look at what he did with Twitter. OK, seven words, 30 words, whatever the F it is. It's like that is his way of communicating, and it has been incredibly successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. It, it, it's it's mind boggling. Yeah. <sighs> well, like, this gives us hope for the future. This has been us. <laughs> um, but listen, I want to tell you one more thing before before I'm done with you, and that is about. Are you done with me? Are you <laughs> going to be done with us? Make sure I'm done with you <laughs> before I'm finished. The synergy between colleges and universities and hospitality. Okay, so we talked about this last time, but I just wanna reiterate, 
We have colleges and universities who are contracting with hotels to supply room and board because they're not allowed to have roommates anymore. So they're having to find housing and also feeding for things like isolation and quarantine. So if right. you have a university in your town, I would talk to them about any of those needs that they have. Also, we have a lot of um, hotels that are connected to our universities that are providing learning spaces for students and also families who are like, we're sick of being together in the same space. We want to go somewhere else and have a different space where all of our kids can learn. Um, so I think that that's really interesting. We talked last time about, um, in fact, I just did a conference for a bunch of schools and I said, hey, hospitality, you have a lot of hotels that would love to have your business. Go to HR and ask them to partner with the hotel to send faculty and staff, even just for a day retreat. And all of the schools were like furiously scribbling that down because it was such a good um, outlet for their faculty and staff to be able to get a break. Um, and then also, I would just say, if you have employees that you are interested in getting some more um, education through a college, schools, their enrollment is down. And so they are looking for students to enroll. So you might be able to negotiate a better rate for your employees and get some of the classes that they need. So, so now, so now, so scholars, uh, so so colleges are becoming like used car uh, lots. Basically, I don't know if you heard. Twenty percent of Harvard accepted freshmen deferred until next year. Until next year, wow! So that was in the fall. Twenty percent of them said we are not well, coming. My my, my 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 daughter is one of my daughter's friends, and her boyfriend's best friend got into Harvard this year, and he deferred to next year. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, Anthony, you made a good point there. What do you think is the going rate of a used diploma? And uh, can we get can we get uh, you, you know what? Unfortunately, it's become where people just want the paper. That's right. And and you know, beforehand, what I would tell kids is you have to go to college and you have to get the paper, or go in the military or become an electrician. But you have to. You can't take two years off. Unless you're going, you know, to Africa to help, you know, to help people, you can't. You have to be doing something. You just can't find yourself. As my my uh, wife's friend said to her, to her son, it's like I'm trying to find myself. And she said in her Brooklyn way, "Well, you better effing try to find him quick because I see him right in front of me." So, so my point being is, this year you can take that opportunity to not so much find yourself, but find what motivates you and your passion. You know. I'm not good at that. But I'm not good at just taking time off to kind of like just hang out for myself because I in, I'm inherently lazy and I like doing nothing. I really, really, I, my hobby is nothing. I like it. <laughs> and, and and so I don't do nothing because if I did nothing, I would do nothing all the time. So you have to really fight against that, but do something that's productive, but that is helping you get to the point that is going to find you happiness and gratitude. Those are the only things you have to find is happiness and gratitude. You find those two things and somehow, some way, the universe will conspire your success and you'll pay your mortgage. Yeah. Sure, but one other thing you got to find is find your way to pharosresources.com. Right, Rachel? Yes, please do. If you um, work for an institution or if you have a student and you have questions about how their college or university is um, kind of navigating this COVID um, situation, we have, I think, over 25 webinars. Many of them I've done with Anthony, but many of the other ones are just, hey, this is what schools should be thinking about and how they should be communicating. And so I am happy to be connected to you um, and to answer whatever questions so, you have. So if you're a parent and you don't think the college is doing what they need to do, who should be your first call? Because I've had this problem myself and I have no idea who to call. Yeah, I would call the dean of students. Okay. So the dean of students is going to be over all of student life, which is kind of that community piece. Um, and that's probably your best bet. On the other side, if it's like just a straight academic issue, I would call the provost. But those two will be the ones who are kind of in charge of the, the two streams. That and and, and uh, what percentage of the dean of students or the provost will call me back and how many will have their underlings call me back? Um, I guess it depends on the size of the school. School, I would say for smaller schools, the dean or the provost will call you back. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you ever call me back, Rachel? I just text you all the time. Hey, <laughs> people don't call me anymore. What, what's that? Today is Matt's birthday. Ooh, is he 29 yet? Not quite. <laughs> I'm gonna, wait, I'm going to go on a limb and get, get in a lot of trouble here. He is 
42. Oh, you'll make him so happy. He's not 40. He's older than that. <laughs> okay. You're welcome, Matt. <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate thank you. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Good to see you guys. Excellent. Take care, Rachel. So, Anthony, so I got my piece of paper that my that we spent tens of thousands of dollars on, and it's done me a it's done me a whole lot of good over, over there. That's for sure. But uh, yeah, who would have thought that we would have had her on to talk about helping students find success and get into a whole conversation about social media? mindfulness and all of these other things you know that's why that's why i love having this, this because success, success is not real happiness and gratitude is real because your level of success what you value success to be is not what i value success to be that's right i've never looked i've been very fortunate where my passion has brought me money mm -hmm. and i've done very well mm -hmm. i have never once in my life chased money with that said, right. when I negotiate, I'm a son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. I'm hard to negotiate with because I know my value. Right. When I was younger, I didn't know my value. I know my value now, so I say no to a lot, but and I and I negotiate. But once I negotiate, I triple down and I do a better job than they ever thought I would do. So by by chasing happiness and gratitude, I've been able to find my value, and the money will come because. I know my value. When you don't know your value, you're going to take a discount. You're going to give people terms and you're going to do things that maybe you shouldn't do. So chasing happiness and gratitude right. fixes all your problems, in my opinion. Yeah, it really does. And that value thing is really, really important. That's a problem that I've had in my, my life is always undervaluing me when other people may not perceive me in that same sort of way. And also the success thing where people might say, Hey, Glenn, you're successful, but I never, ever feel that way. So it's always kind of, a, you know, it's always a give and take and trying to figure that out. And do well, you best. know, so when, when some people like, I don't know what that means. I really don't. When people say, Anthony, you've done this, you accomplished this. I don't know what that success means. I don't know what it means. I always I feel it's, it's going to be happy, that next thing. No, see, to me, it's like, I would like, I've had in the pandemic, I've had three bad days, three days where I didn't feel good. And my daughter, I actually, I was talking about it yesterday. I was like, I didn't get caught up in anything other than why didn't I feel like that? It's because I wasn't feeling happy and grateful. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this thing or that thing or the other thing. And I'm just like, you know what? Screw that. It's like, let me, let me zero in on what really makes me happy. And what makes me happy, I've never ever gotten a contract or have gotten um, a check and said, oh my God, this makes me so happy. You know, I was like, oh my God, this leads me to happiness. Like somebody said to me, actually my trainer said to me, uh, what, um, uh, what is your favorite job? Mm -hmm. And he just asked me, I think yesterday. And I said, I have two, one working the line at, at, at the front desk. I like being a line employee. I loved it. Um, and the day I got the Hotel Impossible gig, and but that wasn't my favorite job. Hotel Impossible was definitely not my favorite job, but it was it, I was the most grateful for that because it gave me a lot of happiness and a lot of um, a lot of opportunity that made me happy. It made me it let me ski in Switzerland. It let me understand um, you know Mexico a little bit better because I learned a lot about Mexico. I I went to fifty states. I or forty eight states. I went to fifty countries. So the access it gave me made me happy. Yeah. But did the job itself make me happy? No, it was fucking hard. Right. Yeah. Having to be on for all those hours constantly for day after day after day. Whew. Speaking about being on uh, on constantly, we'll be back tomorrow. We've got Jerry and Zarello returning tomorrow, Anthony. Isn't that going to be a great show? We have Jason Zarello? Yeah, Jerry and Zarello. James, Jerry's back tomorrow? Yeah, man. And then on Thursday, we've got Dan Flannery, who runs a Marriott's Edition brand. So uh, oh, good. Great. great first week here. Okay, listen, listen. Call everyone you know. Text everyone you know. And do not miss the show tomorrow. Jerry and Zarello is one of the greatest human beings walking the face of the earth. Look him up. Google him. He has done more in his career than most people have done in 37 careers. Um, mm -hmm. When you have Nelson Mandela coming to your birthday parties, when Michael Jackson is your best man, and when Oprah Winfrey calls you because her best friend passed away, and you're a hotel guy, 
and you're a PR guy and you're a marketing guy and somehow you work in the Middle East and you you it is like and he's from Brooklyn, he's from my neighborhood, and he's the most sought after, most likable, most motivational person you'll ever meet. So don't miss uh tomorrow, Jerry and Zarella. That's right. Don't miss that. And be sure to subscribe to the audio feed of our podcast. Go to Checking In with Anthony and Glenn to grab that or No Vacancy with Glenn Hausman feeds on iTunes, Google Play, wherever you want to get your podcasts. We are there. Anthony, you back this Thursday with Hospitality Success? Um, Hospitality Success, I think, is this Thursday at 3 o'clock. But I got to check with my newly married partner, Jeremy. Yes, congratulations to Jeremy, who got married in December. All right, Anthony, let's uh, wrap this you, thing you know up. What got, you know what I gave her for her present? A box of chocolates with my face on it. <laughs> because I couldn't be at the wedding because of COVID. It was just her and her, her, her husband. And so I was like, you know what? If I can't show up, as, as soon as you get into the room, you're going to see a lot of me. <laughs> Completely on brand. All right, Anthony. Remember, everybody, more than ever, you've got one life, so blaze on, and... Be kind to yourself. See you all tomorrow. Thanks so much for watching.